When you were young, I am pretty sure that someone told you at some point that stoves were hot, candles burned, and that running with scissors could cause you to stab someone or yourself if you tripped and fell. And I am pretty sure too that you, like most children, ignored the majority of those warnings. The piece of pencil that embedded itself in my right palm when I was six, and the scars on my elbows from my dad digging out stones with a penknife that came from the farm drive because I was messing around with my bicycle too much, a test that I most certainly did. And I know that you all have your own tales of woe begat by ignoring the warnings of those who knew better. As adults, I'm sure we all still ignore many of those warnings sent our way to some extent. You know, the ones, the warnings to obey the posted speed limit or to eat less processed foods and to exercise more, to wear our seat belts and to keep our wits about us when surfing the internet. Sure, we may obey those ones, I at least try to, but there are others that we as a society have been willfully ignoring. Like, oh, I don't know, the gentle reminder that climatologists have been giving us for more than 125 years that something is up with our climate and we're to blame. Sure, at first those warnings were a little more than a theory, but for nearly the 42 years that I've been on this planet, the warnings from climatologists have been increasingly urgent. In a nutshell, these warnings have told us that our insistence on burning fossil fuels and emitting harmful greenhouse gases into the atmosphere has caused our planet to slowly, inexorably warm up. And unless we cut our emissions as a global community, bad things are on the way. Like extreme weather events, the frequency of which will transition from so-called once-in-a-lifetime occurrences to things that happen so frequently that large parts of the world will cease to be habitable, millions of people will be displaced from their homes and find themselves becoming climate refugees, and the comfortable lifestyle that we take for granted today will become memories in photographs. The Paris Climate Accord was an attempt to limit the heating of the planet due to anthropogenic climate change to less than 2 degrees Celsius when compared to pre-industrial temperatures, or ideally less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. It did this by asking governments of the world to commit to making drastic and sweeping systemic changes to their national emissions targets. Targets, by the way, which were, to all intents and purposes, arbitrarily chosen by each signatory nation. In fact, while each nation is still required to set those targets, they're not technically legally binding. And of course, for as long as I, and I suspect most of you can remember, the IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a United Nations group of 200 or so leading climate scientists who regularly publish reports on the current and future effects of anthropogenic climate change, have been warning us with increasing urgency that time is running out. That without urgent action, we won't hit the Paris Climate Accord targets, or in fact, be able to stop the planet from entering into a phase of its history where life as we know it on Earth will not be sustainable. Earlier this week, the IPCC published its largest and most comprehensive report to date, containing the information from over 14,000 peer-reviewed scientific papers, its prognosis for us humans is grim. Gone are the warnings of what could or might happen if we don't act, and in their place, a foreshadowing of what is likely to happen, as well as recommendations for what we can and should do now immediately to minimise the horror of what future generations will have to face. This report details that we humans have already caused significant damage to our small blue dot in the unfashionable western spiral arm of the galaxy. The actions of humans has already caused approximately one degree Celsius of global warming compared to pre-industrial levels. Worse, it states, with a high degree of confidence, backed by all of those scientific papers, global warming will reach 1.5 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels as soon as 2030. And no. Today we are not going to be debating if anthropogenic climate change is a thing, because this report squarely and irrefutably lays that particular argument to rest again. 
Our planet's climate has already changed, and this report says it will impact all of us in one way or another. Sea levels will rise, glaciers are and will continue to melt and collapse. Faster, in fact, in many cases than previously predicted, and millions of people who live in low-lying areas of the world will find their homes consumed by the sea. Global temperatures are rising faster than originally predicted too, and every single region of the world is set to face accelerated climate change. Further, because our planet's ecosystems are a little bit like that pot of boiling water on your stove, we've got to the point where it's going to take some time for the Earth to react to us changing our ways, even if we do it today. In other words, things are going to continue to simmer for a while, even if you turn the heat off now. We will see permafrost thawing amplified, and we will see the loss of glaciers that are hundreds of thousands of years old. The ocean will become more acidic, and oxygen levels will drop, which will threaten sensitive oceanic ecosystems, as well as the lives and the livelihoods of those who rely on the sea to survive. Simply put, how you experience the effects of anthropogenic climate change will vary depending on where you live in the world. Here in the Pacific Northwest of the US, we've been seeing unusually high temperatures caused by heat domes as the usual Pacific Ocean weather patterns that keep us cool break down. And in parts of Europe, specifically my home country of the UK, the breakdown of the Gulf Stream is already causing extreme swings in temperatures between summer and winter weather not the temperate, pleasant environment of my youth. If you read this report, and you should, because while it's pretty long, I can't detail everything here comprehensively, you are probably feeling like a lot of the team here at the channel, that everything is pointless and, well, we're screwed. But there was a ray of light in the report, namely that while it's too late to stop the effects of anthropogenic climate change having a dramatic impact on the lives of most people on the planet, there is still time to make dramatic changes to the way we all live and the way that governments and corporations run in order to minimise just how bad, bad really gets. So today, I'm going to try and detail some of the things you can do now to affect your own world, affect the governments of the nations you live in, and how you can share the urgency of the situation with people who, to this point, have maintained that climate change is just some kind of Chinese-Jewish gay space laser hoax. And yes, I know, I just took two pages of scripts to get to what's in the video. But you know, if long essay introductions are good enough for my wife's second favourite lesbian on TV, then it's good enough for me. The urgency of the report isn't something you can or should ignore. The planet will continue to be just fine, of course, whatever happens, but we humans, and plenty of other life we are used to, will not. While we can't stop the effects of anthropogenic climate change from being felt, we can and should lessen their impact by acting. And this starts today with everyone. First, and <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm preaching to the choir, we need to stop using fossil fuels for heating our homes, generating electricity, and our transportation. And that means hitting something we call net zero, the point at which we achieve net zero emissions in everything we do within the next decade or two. Net zero doesn't necessarily mean completely zero emission, but rather being as close to zero emissions with everything that's possible to be zero emission with, and then negating the effects of things that currently do and will continue to create carbon emissions by offsetting them with activities that capture an equivalent amount of carbon from the atmosphere. In our world, the world of cleaner, greener, safer and smarter transportation, this means avoiding using fossil fuel vehicles and seeking alternatives instead. Of course, that means making your next car an electric one instead of an internal combustion engine one. That alone will make a dramatic difference to your own personal carbon footprint, especially if you're lucky enough to be able to charge that car at home using renewable energy that you've generated on the roof of your home or that you've purchased by a local utility company. But, and this is a big but, Making any new car creates carbon emissions, and while many automakers are now committing to making their production lines net zero emission, it is super important to remember that you really should not be swapping your vehicle out every few years. 
Let's not kid ourselves. There's something of a social cachet in most modern societies to owning the latest and greatest car. Switching your car out every few years has been treated by many as a way of showing your social status. And keeping a car for five years or more has been seen by some in society as a less desirable thing. Even Tesla has engaged in encouraging existing owners to upgrade their cars every two or three years to the new hotness. Yet we all need to stop doing that where absolutely possible. Sure, people's needs change over time and switching out for a genuine reason like, I need a bigger car because I've got a baby on the way, is very different to, oh, but this new car will park itself. That mentality also needs to apply to gadgets and pretty much every other high value item in our lives that requires a lot of resources to produce. Luckily though, automakers and electronics companies are slowly but surely coming around to the idea that things need to last longer and that we need to hold on to things for longer periods of time in order to lessen our resource consumption. Over the air updates and software updates in general will certainly help that. And buying a car with an over the air software update system could lessen your itch to buy that new hotness. And when it comes to electronics, we're starting to see companies focus on producing software updates that aren't just about making things faster and more feature packed, but more efficient too. But I've digressed. Let's get back to EVs and transportation in general. While switching to an electric car can certainly help lower your overall transportation carbon footprint, especially if you own that electric vehicle for a substantial period of time, there are even smarter things that you can do to lower that footprint further. And it all revolves around the idea that you shouldn't just replace a gasoline or diesel car with an electric one and call it good. You should make the switch to an EV, but then you need to be mindful about your overall usage of that vehicle. First, we should all be planning our errands and trips better. We've all got used to just jumping in the car and going to get the one thing we need when we need it. And electric vehicles make that even easier to do because they are so darned affordable to run. But planning errands into one or two multi-stop trips a week rather than lots of little ones will actually also help lower your carbon footprint. And then there's the question of, do you really need to take the car? So many of society's trips are under a mile or two in length. Could you walk or cycle? Those are the lowest impact methods of travel and they're good for your health as well, or at least they are most of the time. Or perhaps you might consider buying or using a micro mobility solution, such as a foldable electric scooter in preference to using a taxi or an Uber or a Lyft. Public transportation is also something we all need to get used to using. Sure, you might be driving your brand new zero emission electric car to work every day, happily sitting there in the traffic jam, knowing that your EV is charged by the solar panels on your roof. But you just sitting in that traffic jam is making the traffic jam worse. Congestion leads to increased emissions, especially in urban areas in the winter, where cars that have just been turned on sit there with their engines struggling to heat up to optimum temperatures. Frankly, if there is a mass transit option near you, you should consider using that instead. Most mass transit systems in most major metropolitan areas are now powered by electricity and the emissions per passenger mile are far lower than they would be for individual cars on the freeway. Look, I know that traveling by mass transit isn't everyone's cup of tea. As an introvert, it isn't mine. But if there is a park and ride stop near you that you can park your EV at and then take the metro into town from there, consider doing it. Because you not helping to clog up the road will ultimately reduce emissions. EV trips aside, let's look at other ways to reduce your overall carbon footprint. If your job involves a lot of sitting at a desk with a computer, working from home might remain the best option from an emission standpoint as long as your boss is okay with that. But thanks to COVID, telecommuting is becoming far more socially acceptable and you might be able to work with your boss to negotiate working from home even just two days a week in order to dramatically reduce your overall carbon emissions. How about vacation time? Well, traditionally, we'd all just fly. But as COVID has shown, there are some benefits to driving instead, such as reduced risk of infection, especially if you have an electric car. 
the cost of traveling by EV can actually be really super affordable. While the longest distance trips might still be best by plane, shorter trips, the kind you might achieve in an hour or so in the air, might be something you should consider taking an electric car for, if possible. We now try to take all of our short and mid-range trips by EV, which might take a little longer time-wise, but lowers our emissions and is really quite enjoyable. So how about those of you who keep that gas pickup truck or SUV in reserve for just-in-case emergencies? Well, now's the time to ask yourself if it's really necessary. Many new electric cars coming to market are capable of towing, and unless you live in a super rural area, most cities have rental fleets that you can use when absolutely necessary. Frankly, vehicles that aren't used regularly aren't going to run as cleanly or as well as newer vehicles, even ones on a rental fleet where cars and trucks are notoriously terribly abused. Next. Let's talk about consuming things, namely food. Meat farming is extremely carbon intensive and changing our diet to eliminate or drastically reduce the amount of meat we eat is going to make a big carbon reduction impact. There are far better places today that we can use to get protein from than intensively farmed meat. Personally, I've switched most of my meat consumption to alternatives like impossible meat which has a 13 times lower carbon dioxide per burger emissions than a beef burger, and is a lot healthier for you as well. But if you don't want to be vegan or vegetarian, knowing where your meat comes from and being able to choose where you get your meat, milk and cheese from will also have an impact on reducing your carbon footprint. For example, it is far better to buy milk directly from a local farm that has a small herd of grass-fed animals than it is to buy milk from a supermarket which likely has gotten that milk from a mega dairy where there are so many cattle that the grass can't cope and all feed has to be brought in. The first example of farming is usually done by a small local family business who understands the land and respects the animals, while the latter is often a facility where money comes above all else. Remember too that some animals tend to have a much higher carbon footprint than others. For example, chicken and fish have pretty low carbon footprints compared to other meat. Another important protein source that it's popular in much of the world, but still struggling to gain a foothold in America, is insects. Insect farming consumes very few resources, especially water, for how much protein it produces. I know the idea of eating insects, even the ones that are honestly quite tasty, isn't palatable to many of you, but it is normal in most of the world and can be a huge way to reduce resource consumption in our food supply chain. One way that I'm working to lower my own carbon footprint at my home is to have a small flock of chickens. They are fed on scraps from our kitchen, locally produced feed and garden produce and they provide a good, low-emission source of high-protein eggs. I know my chickens are very healthy, have a good life, and they are nothing like the chickens found in the majority of mass production farming facilities around the world. To vegetables and other foodstuffs. We've gotten used to being able to buying things wherever and whenever we want them, regardless of if they're in season or not. And while it is nice to be able to have tomatoes in December in the Northern Hemisphere, those tomatoes are likely shipped from thousands of miles away or grown in facilities that require a lot of excess heating. So get used to looking at labels and get used to what grows where and when. It's taken us some time to get used to this, but in winter I've switched to using root vegetables, sourced either from my local farm store or my own garden, in order to prepare food. While not everyone has a garden and not everyone has access to a farm store, knowing what grows at what time of year should help ensure that you're not buying produce that has flown halfway around the world. And while I'm at it, try to reduce the amount of heavily processed food you buy. It might be easy food, but heavily processed foods always have a far higher carbon footprint than just buying raw ingredients. Next, let's talk about energy use. I know that I am one to talk because I run a company at my home and there are servers here that make my home electricity bill horrendous. But knowing what electricity your gadgets consume and being willing to turn them off when not in use will really help lower your electricity bill and your carbon footprint.
we've been able to knock a hundred bucks or so off hours just by making sure everything's turned off when we don't need them. And I bet you can do the same. And of course, when dealing with home heating or cooling, try to use both in moderation. Wearing a sweater or a jumper in the winter is far better than cranking up the heating just so you can wander around in your flimsy PJs. Finally, let's talk about being active and proactive in your community. While not everyone wants to be involved in politics, which you can obviously do, joining local cooperatives dedicated to lowering our collective carbon footprint or generating renewable electricity in local communities can really help make a difference. If you are looking to invest, you might even be able to find a local energy community project that needs some funding to help get off the ground without relying on big Wall Street types. Decentralizing our power networks, working towards resilience and renewable energy generation for everyone will make a major impact of our overall carbon footprint. And if you have the skills to help someone convert their car to electric or build an electric bicycle, or perhaps retrofit a home with a more efficient heating system, better insulation or something else, consider getting stuck in. So there you have it. The future is bleak if we continue to do nothing, but if we all do our bit, we can make major improvements to mitigate the effects. And while I'm sure someone in the comments will finger point and say, yeah, but other people aren't doing anything, so why should I? My response is really simple. Leading by example and encouraging others to follow is far better than ignoring the situation and hoping someone else will fix it. Because as I'm sure you know, if everyone assumes someone will clean up the mess, nobody will. Let's not enact tragedy of the commons on a global scale, because for the overwhelming majority of this, this is the only planet we, and our children, are ever going to have. That's it for today. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and our two other channels, Transport Evolved Take Two and Transport Evolved Shorts. We know that most of you are subscribed, but there are a significant number that aren't. So go on, hit the bell and help us out. Let us know what you thought of the video below. And if you're not someone who likes the comment section, then why not head over to our Discord server? It's free and we will leave the link below. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, that's Andrew Martin, Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Raging Fellows, Carl Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tazla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. They're John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you'd like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, you'll also find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. And of course, you can buy your very own TE swag at our Redbubble store. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!